Hi guys, it's uh, Liz from Duda. Thank you for joining us for our workshop today. We're bringing up all of our lovely panelists back into the mix right now so we can go ahead and get this started. Um, today, we are gonna be working with this group to talk about how you can help your customers recover from COVID-19. It's obviously the topic on everybody's mind today. And we thought we should deep dive into what a few different companies and uh, individuals are looking at to make this happen. So the big question for today is what can be done today to help small businesses weather the uncertainty and the very real impacts and changes that are coming from our current COVID-19 state and what's gonna be happening well into the future um, as we're all seeing these impacts. So everybody joining me today in the webinar, we have a couple of great people on today's panel. Um, my name is Liz. I am the director of account management for Duda. So I, me and my team work with the largest agencies and companies utilizing Duda and talk to thousands of customers on a really consistent basis about what they're doing with their web presence. And hi, Kevin, you uh, I'm ahead Kevin Getch. And yourself? Yeah. Yeah, happy to. Hi, I'm Kevin Getch. I'm the founder and director of Digital Strategy at Web4. We work with small to international companies on their online presence, everything from strategy to execution, search engine optimization, paid search content strategy, and social media. And I'm Andrew Shotland, founder of Local SEO Guide and expert local marketer. Oh, well, the picture there is underneath my... No, anyway, I'm Greg Sterling. I'm the VP of Market Insights for Uberall, and I'm excited to be a part of this uh, discussion today. Um, my role is to go through data and pull out insights, and hopefully I'll have a few of those. And now to the real Andrew Shotland. Thank you. Yeah, I'm definitely not Greg Sterling. Uh, hi, I'm, you may have heard of me. I'm Andrew Shotland. <laughs> um, I'm the CEO of Local SEO Guide. We are a um, SEO focused agency that works with big small brands and agencies to help them with what we consider one of the most ridiculous marketing channels on the planet, but we like to do it. So let's go. Liz. All right. Thanks, everybody. So jumping into what to expect today, um, we're going to have Greg start with actually going through the data and what we're seeing in the market. So having some real numbers is always a helpful way to start and make decisions. Then we're going to go into some basic things that everybody can be doing right now to make an impact. And then we're going to have um, everybody go into a little bit about their experience, their insights, and what they're seeing in the market, followed up by a QA um, session with the audience after a little bit of a panel discussion amongst ourselves. So Greg, we'll let you kick it off. Okay, Liz. Um, so, Denver Broadband is letting me down at the moment. Yes, I'm waiting for the slide to appear. Um, basically, the data doesn't tell a very pretty story. There are some sort of green shoots and some reasons for me too. A hopeful uh, thinking, but it's a, a difficult situation, and everybody knows that firsthand. And um, basically, the U.S. economy is in recession. The European economy is in recession. Uh, everybody is aware of the, the depth of that. I think we missed a slide, but okay, let's go back a little bit. Yes, so we're in recession. Um, I don't have to belabor that point. Next slide, please. And what that means basically is that consumers have become much more sensitive about spending money, and I think we're going to see this into Q2. Um, and it'll eventually impact B2B because everything sort of ultimately resolves to a consumer transaction. So across categories, people are pulling back spending uh, as a general matter. There are some, some categories where there are increases in spending, but for the most part, people are um, discretionary spending has been reduced and need-based spending has been increased. Um, let's go to the next slide. And this is something that people are going to have to contend with. So um, I'm not sure if this is actually the next slide, but let's assume that it is. Um, so one of the hopeful things that exists in the market is that both small businesses and consumers expect that the crisis isn't going to last that much longer. That may be a false hope, but let's hope that it's not. Um, most people don't believe this is a, a, a consumer 
um, survey. Most people don't believe it's going to be more than six months, and we'll see some return to normalcy. That remains to be seen, but let's let's hope. On to the next slide. So this is another hopeful indicator. Um, what these lines represent are, please return to the previous slide. Yes, thank you. Um, what these lines indicate is uh, a downward trend in consumer sentiment across major um, categories of spending and um, outlook, economy, job, uh, home buying, major purchases. Now, what you see at the end is an uptick in almost all of those except for jobs. So that indicates that people are feeling better about the outlook for these different kinds of uh, purchase, purchases and spending categories. Next slide. And this is a Shopify chart that was tweeted out by their CTO. And what it indicates is that they saw a lot of online activity, a lot of online buying, which may have been a, a byproduct of the uh, first wave of stimulus checks in the U.S., um, but it also may indicate that there's an upper, you know, certainly there's been a, a pretty significant increase in e-commerce, 30% across the board, some categories much higher than that, and, and this is consistent with that. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so um, we've got two stories circulating in the market sort of simultaneously, and they're pretty, uh, it's a pretty bifurcated situation. We've got one story which is suggesting that this is uh, an economy that's going to rival the Great Depression, and then another story which suggests this is not going to be a, a lasting problem. We've shut down the economy artificially. Once it opens back up, we're going to see a so-called V-shaped recovery. Most people now don't believe that because of all the job losses, but hopefully it'll be a quicker recovery than the image on the left, off the left which is pretty grim. In all likelihood, it'll be somewhere in the middle. And certain industries will recover more quickly and others it will take longer. Um, but I'm, I'm hopeful that it's going to be on the shorter end of things. And let's go to the next slide, which may be the end of mine. Oh, no, it's not. There are a whole bunch more, but I'll go through them quickly. OK, <laughs> so let's talk about small businesses, the purpose of this webinar. Um, lots of small businesses have been impacted. Almost 90% of North American small businesses have been affected by this. But they too, like consumers, believe that the uh, crisis will be over relatively soon. Although businesses are a bit less optimistic and believe it'll take till 2021. Let's go to the next slide. Now, this I believe is my final slide here. Oh no, one more, sorry. Um, small business marketing plans, okay? You've seen, you guys have probably reduced your spend, focused more on performance marketing, uh, small businesses tend to see online marketing as part of a discretionary, their discretionary budget, and they pull it back when there's a crisis or they need to conserve money. Um, this, this indicates, this is just one survey, that it's a mix. Some people will spend about the same, some people are going to spend more, some people don't know yet, and others will pull back. So we've got a, quite a mixed situation out there, which is good because it means not everybody has, has cut off their marketing budgets. Okay, what kind of help do they want from you? What kind of uh, uh, advice and assistance do these small businesses need? Well, first they want help about money, their immediate sort of financial problems. And then they want to know how to protect customers and their employees from the impact of the virus. And that's part of the challenge of opening back up. But the blue, the blue lines indicate the marketing assistance that they need. They need help on, with social. They need help with e-commerce uh, and web development, um, which is what Duda does. They also need uh, help about diversifying their business model, which more or less means e-commerce, and then uh, additional services that they can use to accommodate uh, customers in this new environment, like delivery. And then, off to Kevin. Thanks, Greg. So um, I wanted to share um, some of the, my insights as well as talk a little bit uh, more strategy related. Uh, I find myself um, kind of being a motivational speaker for a lot of clients lately, and um, I wanted to just share this with you is, um, you know, what what do you think the number one determining factor of any company's success is during any challenge? The simple answer is that it's the mindset of the company's leader or leadership, depending on the size of the company. It's the number one determining factor of how they're going to get through this challenge and through this problem. On the next slide, you'll see that, um, 
I, I put a lot of focus on this because I've seen businesses um, where I sat down with them, did a little brainstorm with them, and we totally turned things around just by actually touching on some of the things Greg talked about is how to get their mind right so they can start innovating and switching how they deliver their product or service or what opportunities uh, come up from this. And so I love this quote from Albert Einstein. He says, in the middle of every difficulty lies opportunity. And my son is uh, plays uh, competitive basketball, and he used to always – uh, get frustrated and complain when he was playing on a dusty floor. And I asked him, how does that affect your performance? How do you think that makes you do? Well, it, I, I don't do as well. I get frustrated. Well, is everyone else on the same playing field? Is everyone else on the same floor? Okay, yeah, so they're frustrated. Well, what if you had your mind in a good spot and you actually knew that, used that to your advantage? So we're all in this in the same spot. And I want to show you what happens on the next slide in a uh, economy when it's it retracting like this is – what happens is you you might start out with, um, and you'll have to click through this a couple times, Liz, um, just once real quick on the market share. So you might start out with having 1% market share, right? And then as the market uh, retracts on the next click, you'll see um, you might have 1% of a smaller market, right? And so what will happen is you get in this kind of market and you have to work twice as hard for half as much. And that's the reality that we're in right now. And so you'll see the next is you may get to 2% market share, of a smaller market. The good thing is we all know every, everyone out there says, yes, we are going to get out of this, but more of a question of when, how fast. So as the market expands back to a larger market, you'll see you have 2% now of a larger market. And so companies that are prepared, uh, that have the right mindset, um, will actually come out of this in an advanta advantageous way. On the next slide, um, uh, you'll see, I, I actually wrote, um, I launched a, well, actually, I'll touch on this real quick is I love this quote. Actually, one of my favorite oxymorons is anticipatory retaliation, uh, kind of like a military oxymoron for first strike. But I love this quote from Wayne Gretzky is you need to skate to where the puck will be, not where it has been. So it's important to get your client's mindset on where they need to be uh, in the coming month to months uh, and get their mindset focused on that. Uh, and that'll help you out a lot as far as getting helping them uh, as well as getting uh, what you need done. So on the next slide, you'll see I, I outlined this very simple methodology in a book I uh, launched last year, but it was more around how to um, how to handle some of the technology that was coming. And so um, while the slide uh, you'll see here, uh, the book's called Future Proof Your Marketing, and it was really to handle AI. It was how, how are you going to handle and combat differences and changes in technology? And so I came up with this very simple methodology. Number one is you have to know and love your customer. Uh, a lot of times we make our first love our product or service, and that kind of – it puts us in a tough position because a challenge like this happens, and we're not able to adapt how we deliver or change the product that we offer to our clients. You have to – if you focus on know and love your customer, as their needs change, you can change to adapt uh, what you're delivering to make sure you're meeting their needs. And I wanted to provide a little more context to this so you'll see next. It's really about not just – like a lot of people think they know their customer, but it's important to understand their deep psychological needs, um, their behaviors, their customer journey. Because when you know all those things, it's not hard to give the right message to the customer that resonates with them, right? And if you know their journey, then it's not hard to develop a strategy, which is the next bullet point, around meeting their customer, meeting their customer where they are. So if you have the right message and you have it in the right places and times, now Right. So it's all about kind of breaking it down, because I believe uh, complexity is the enemy of execution in a strategy. And then the next thing is to measure, monitor and adapt your strategy, because uh, planning or strategy should not be like a singular thing. It's something that's always going on. Something like this happens. You have to do it much quicker. And that term uh, anticipatory retaliation, I think the next level would be when you get to the point where you know your customer so well, you're able to anticipate their needs and deliver on those uh, even before they ask for something. So um, on the next slide, you'll see one of the things that I look at is I uh, do discovery. Um, actually, this I love this quote by Peter Drucker, is uh, the aim of marketing is to know and understand the customer so well the product or service just fits them and sells itself. And I think that's really key. And I can guarantee you at least 95% of your clients uh, don't have their messaging right. They haven't really dove in and understood the customer to the point where they're creating both their messaging, their experience to really, um, I guess, create an amazing experience for their customers. So on the next slide, uh, you'll see that uh, uh, this is an acronym I like to use, FUD. So you see Elmer over in there in the corner, so it reminds you of Elmer FUD. Uh, but it's what are their fears? 
What are their uncertainties? What are their desires? And how do they make decisions? And when you dive into this and do a deep discovery, it allows you to kind of work backwards from that and create both the messaging and the experience that meets the customer and really takes care of them. And the what we like to do is take a deep understanding of psychology and combine it with um, data, right? Data-driven approach to where we actually subject, not subjective or objectively prove that this is better messaging by using A-B testing and, and analytics and things like that. So on the next slide, you'll see um, it's really just about tying it all together in a strategy. And uh, I wanted to offer this, um, if you go to, if you click one more time, you'll see that uh, you can download this for free. Uh, this is the thing that we saw as an opportunity for our clients that most of our clients didn't really understand the unique value that they brought and how to meet the client's psychological needs, how to communicate that. So we created this simple um, worksheet and just delivered it out really quick and said, hey, we'll brainstorm on this with you, but you can also do it on your own and start working through some of this. So it was just a way to add more value to our customers. And on the next slide, I just wanted to wrap it together by saying, I've seen this over and over when you have a comprehensive customer-centered strategy where you really know the customer, know their needs, it's integrated across channels, tactics, and the teams are working together, they're not siloed. Um, I've seen 10 times more effectiveness in those results uh, from that. So I think that's a great opportunity to um, take care of your customers right now is think about uh, where they're lacking in their strategy and see where you can help in aligning them a little more effectively there. And I think uh, with that, uh, I'll pass it to Mr. Shotlin. And Thank very you. quickly, uh, before uh, Andrew, just before you take over, I did just want to remind everybody in the audience, if you have questions, please go ahead and put them into the question box. We're collecting those and we'll use them at the end for QA. So you can ask those at any point during this. And we are also recording this. So anybody that, um, if you miss any piece of it or want to go back and look again, we'll make sure that everybody gets a copy of this at the end. Uh, thanks. All right, Andrew, back to you. <laughs> Uh, so I figured I'd spend my time talking a little bit about some of the tactics we're using right now to try to help clients combat this this time. Um, you know, I don't think anything we're doing is like rocket science. Um, it's not like we have 50 million different um, levers we can pull, but there are a few things that we're doing that have been quite effective. Thought it might be interesting to share them with you. Um, so the first one is uh, I, I just thought this this is a Google Trend shot of of a couple of local queries. And what we can see is that in many categories, local search is still happening. Um, so people are um, probably been um, sitting at home for a while, bored out of their minds, checking the news and what the, the government's doing every five seconds and maybe their bank account. And now they're starting to, um, to probably look for stuff more. Let's go to the next one. Um, interesting, as Greg mentioned about e-commerce trends, this is another study done of um, different e-commerce sites. 15% of people who bought in the past 30 days, it was the first time in the, or the first time in the past six months that they um, they had bought something online. So e-commerce, the trend to online is, is this, the, the coronavirus is like sped that up. Let's go to the next one. Coming. Um, I thought this was kind of interesting showing what people are buying. And we're definitely seeing this on, we, we actually have some clients who are fairly big e-commerce sites and we're seeing, um, we're seeing this trend where the need products are taking over. And so as an example, if you sell Lysol right now, you're probably getting a lot of traffic. If you sell wipes, um, toilet paper, hand sanitizers, et cetera. Um, we have a client who ranked on page one of Google. Actually, they ranked on page two of Google for hand sanitizer. But everyone was out of stock, so everyone was going to page two, clicking on their URL a lot and cranking them up to page one. And guess what? They ran out of hand sanitizer in about 24 hours. Um, so, uh, so anyhow, not a big revelation, but if you have products that people need at this moment, now's a good time to put those right on the front page of your website, um, optimize on ranking for those. Um, let's go to the next one. And as I said, um, we're seeing this across the board almost on every type of client we work on. Consumers are coming back to websites. Whether they're buying or not is a whole different thing, but we're seeing traffic back to where it was for most sites we're working on, um, uh, in some cases, greater than it was pre-COVID. And that's probably because these are seasonal, seasonal businesses. So right now we're in the season. Let's say if you're a landscaping company, 
your traffic is probably higher regardless of what's happening with COVID because everyone's trying to grow their garden or something. Um, so, so there is traffic. And um, uh, this was another uh, survey of CMOs I thought was interesting. Uh, I believe something like 73% of them said they were going to do more marketing as a result of coronavirus. Um, so, uh, and we're definitely seeing that. We have a big brand we work with. They furloughed, I think, 7,000 people. No one in the marketing department was touched because they're kind of what Kevin was alluding to with the um, anticipatory retaliation. Was that what the phrase you called it? Um, so their thinking is this is going to end and they're going to come out of it stronger because they have the capital that they can put to basically maintaining their brand in a, in a you know, even improve their brand at this moment. Um, let's go to the next one. And, and this is my favorite self-serving, um, hey, I do SEO slide. Um, Google Trends is showing that searches for search engine optimization have gone through the roof. While surprise, surprise, searches for things like Google Ads, pay-per-click, online advertising have basically flattened or dropped. Um, so, um, and that's pretty much on trend with what we've seen with clients who previous to COVID were spending a ton of money on pay-per-click. It's not that, um, not, not everyone turned their pay-per-click down to zero, but we keep hearing over and over again that everyone was like, oh, we wish we had invested more in SEO so we could be getting quote unquote free traffic right now because we can't afford to pay for it. Um, again, self-serving SEO advertisement there. Um, let's go to the next one. So there's a couple of basic things you can do. Um, the, the, the first new thing that Google introduced was this stuff called COVID schema, which is essentially adding a uh, code or markup to your website to say, hey, we have, um, in the case of most businesses, it's not really relevant, but the one that's relevant for most is the announcement of revised hours and shopping restrictions. Um, so if you have a business that has location information and hours, you should be adding this COVID schema if you've changed it um, to uh, have special hours or special services for COVID. That said, and it's supposed to look kind of like what that screenshot I put together on the right. That said, as you can see, we work with Sam's Club. Um, uh, we've implemented this on their site and it doesn't show that. So um, it, it, it may or may not work as with all structured data, but it's an easy thing to do, so you may want to try it. Um, the thing I haven't listed here is there are some new categories in Google My Business um, that you should be looking at. So if you do curbside pickup, you should be um, up updating your GMB with curbside pickup. We just did that for Sam's Club's locations this morning. So if you search for Sam's Club near me or something, you'll probably see a curbside pickup check mark. Um, and, uh, and delivery, uh, you, can, you can add delivery if you guys are doing delivery as well. Um, so there are little tweaks you can make that might give you that extra edge as people are looking for safe places to shop. Um, okay, let's go to the next one. So this has actually been our primary tactic um, for dealing with COVID. Uh, so AutoNation's client we work with, um, they have uh, 300 dealerships and 300 service centers around the country, so 600 GMB pages. Um, what we first did was they were getting a lot of people wondering whether or not they were open. And in fact, in the first few weeks, they were open for services. So we started with that Google My Business post on the left, which was basically saying, hey, we're open. So if you search for the, the AutoNation, you would see a nice big red, we're open sign. And it, we hope it helped in making sure that people knew they could they could call them or go there. Um, and and then they also had a product that was basically disinfect your car, which we talked about. They said, hey, we really want to push this because we think it's good for um, for people who are concerned about germs. And so we put together this GMB post for all their locations that basically promoted their uh, their uh, their service, and it did really well. Um, and the reason why this was quite effective was there was nothing they had to do on their website. They didn't have to get their developers to update anything. Um, Google My Business is something you can do. Um, if you have a handful of locations, you could do it manually. It takes about five seconds to create one of these ads and put it up. And, um, and in our case, we actually have built a way to um, automate doing this across um, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of, of locations. Um, which you can't do in Google My Business, or anything but COVID-specific announcements right now. Um, they actually they rolled out a COVID-specific Google My Business post 
unit for um, multi-location brands. So you can post COVID specific content there, but you can't for any other type of content. Um, Google will, you probably try, but Google will probably take it down if it doesn't think it's appropriate. So that's why you need to kind of have your own system to do these multi-location um, uh, posts. Um, but they're quite effective because what they basically do is they harvest people who are already looking for your brand and enable you to put like a nice, like nice graphic, nice message that's controllable right in front of them in Google, which you can't really do with a Google My Business page or a panel. Um, let's go to the next one. Uh, and after we had done these COVID updates for a while, we decided that, hey, you know, people are looking to buy stuff. It's okay to sell them stuff now. Um, and so Sam started selling patio furniture because it's, it's patio season and they had a patio furniture sale. So we put a patio furniture GMB post up across 600 locations. And that actually has done pretty nicely in driving people over to their patio furniture um, uh, page. And they have a May instant savings event all month long that just started. So the next one we're gonna do is now promote that so that people know it's happening. Um, and so there are these little things, it doesn't cost a lot to do these kinds of things, but these little things um, actually can help make a difference for brands that are trying to squeak out more sales and more visibility at this time. Um, and there you go, I think that's it. Great. All right. So um, at this point, we've kind of gotten through a little bit of the data and some insights from a few folks on our team. So we, um, we wanna also talk about some advice that we all want to pass on. So the four of us have kind of met over the last few days and really talked about what are the things that we're all seeing that we think are effective and fast things that you can do right now and that everybody really should be taking into consideration to be thinking of during this COVID-19 time. Um, and the first one that I think all of us wildly resoundingly felt like needed to be done is create and be proactive about what you're doing for COVID. Announce it, share it, get it out to the world, um, make sure that you're not um, waiting to do that or assuming that people know that you're taking action. Really make sure that you are proactive in the way that you're presenting your, your activities and your changes with this in mind. Um, a big one that we also talked about is matching your tone to customers' needs and feelings. Um, I think one of us had the example of you probably shouldn't use ads of people giving each other hugs or high fives or things that don't really match the today's world that we're living in. Make sure that you're matching the tone of the moment and the situation that we live in. And also be active about how you are accommodating for the situation. Tell people, if you're a services industry, how am I going to approach you at your home? How am I going to interact and involve with you? If you're not bringing that kind of thing up and really giving people examples and details, you're going to miss out and customers aren't going to aren't, are going to look for somebody that's really looking at those things and speaking about it very clearly other things uh, that we've seen kind of really interesting in the market is make sure your offline communication is updated if people are calling and getting a voicemail that has your normal office hours normal situation in mind then they may feel like maybe these guys aren't even open maybe nothing happened so make sure that all of the areas customers could find you or interact with you are matching don't don't forget about the things that aren't in your digital marketing as well. Uh, and, and kind of the two final things is we understand that there's really a difference between customers that have been dealing with kind of the COVID situation from the beginning when it first came out, places that are still open and adapting their business to be open in an environment like this versus those that are gonna be just now reopening as some of these you know states and communities are starting to come back online in different areas. And while some people have been dealing with this for you know, a couple months at this point, many others are just starting to get back online and those also need to be addressed. So think about the situation that you're in and what it takes to be either in the ongoing or the brand new piece of this as, as, as with an agency focus as we all have on this call, we're working with customers that have a lot of different situations and could be in very different stages of this COVID rollout. And the last one that we brought up was learn from the, the best in your community. There were some good examples, and I'll let you guys talk about these in a minute as well, of you know, restaurant groups or retail groups, uh, statewide associations, and a lot of nonprofit groups as well, kind of getting together and creating best practices and sharing amongst themselves to make sure that 
not only are you following and learning from the best, but that you're being consistent in creating a, uh, an environment where people understand what they're going to get from your businesses and that that resonates in more than one place. Um, so I just kind of went through those really quickly. Anyone else on the panel want to add something to the advice or examples that they've seen of one of these bullet points working really well? Uh, I, I can add this um, uh, working really well, but I was the uh, the instigator of the change of voicemail. Ah, um, uh, uh, yes. Um, so I uh, I have a, a thing I need to get that I could get from Amazon, and I'm like, I'm going to get it from this local guy. I'm going to call to see if he's open. And I got a voicemail that said nothing about whether or not he's open, um, nothing about COVID hours or anything. And it was his website didn't say it. And so it's pretty clear to me that not everybody is tuned into, hey, people are still looking for me, um, even though I might be closed. I have a couple of a uh, couple of comments. Um, there's a lot of information online that can accelerate the learning curve of, of businesses as they try and reopen. There are a lot of trade associations, a lot of groups that have organized and are creating checklists and best practices. And that stuff is readily uh, discoverable. And it's really uh, industry specific. So a lot of the your customers, restaurants, uh, salons, dentists, et cetera, are going to have very specific requirements and needs. And some of that stuff is, is, is uh, discoverable online. Um, you can put that information together for them or point that Point them to that, and that that will really um, help help things out quite a bit. Uh, in terms of um, accommodating the situation and communication, and I'm sure Kevin wants to say a couple of things. Uh, it, it's really important, and this this echoes something Kevin said. It's really important that you understand your customer and the position that your customer is in. There's a lot of generic advice going going out right now, um, very you know very horizontal, high level stuff. But um, you know, restaurants are in a very different circumstance from uh, you know other kinds of businesses. Somebody who's going to come out and uh, trim your trim your trees, or a landscaper, or somebody like that. There's they're very different circumstances, and so it, it's if you if you have insight into your customer situation, you can be much much more helpful to them, uh, and should you know do some discovery, get on the phone with them, understand them. Don't just sort of pu push out a bunch of generic information to them. Yeah, a hundred percent, Greg. I, so the couple things I've been saying is, is increase your communication. Um, really focus on increasing your communication and, and do so with compassion and kindness. Um, I mean, that should always be the approach in my mind is, is really focus on what you give and the value you give and really try to increase that. But more so than ever, I think right now, you need to really look at that and say, hey, how can I, how can I add value? Because we uh, talked about the fears, right? FUD, right? Fears, uncertainties, desires, decision making. If you use that, you can see real quickly some of those may have changed. I was on a conference or a webinar with uh, hotels around the nation, and um, I was explaining to them that my my wife was talking about like we're feeling we're we're feeling cooped up. We want to go travel, but we're like, are there any hotels we can go stay in? And and then she's expressing her fears around well, how did they take care of the hotel? What were the steps that they did? And so this allows you to really understand the customer's specific needs and make sure you're creating content to address those. And the last thing I'd add is right now, if if you have developed a strategy and you really are good at um, developing what we call brand champions. These are people that have had amazing experiences with you, that you're out there marketing for you already, they're your best customers. Now is the time to activate them and make sure that you're out there asking them, letting them know you need support and kind of explain to them. So hopefully you've collected emails. If not, you can use your pixeled audiences or your remarketing and, and all those different aspects, which we can dive into more. I don't wanna jump ahead of ourselves here. I wanna make a follow-up comment about reviews. Um, to Kevin's point about understanding what hotels are safe to stay in. So um, your customers, customers are going to be looking at reviews very carefully right now because not only are reviews uh, going to going to give them information about the quality of the experience or the service, which is how reviews always function, they're going to be a kind of um, way for them to get insight into what you're doing to make the environment that you're maintaining safer or your business practices. So they're going to be looking very carefully to see, are you doing, you know, do you have some kind of safety protocols? What exactly are you doing? Um, consumers will be commenting on those things and that will start showing up in reviews. And so you really want to pay very close attention to that 
and respond to people. And they may voice concerns there that you need to address. Hey, I went into the business and this wasn't happening, or I saw this and I was very concerned. So that's an area of, of, of special heightened sensitivity that you should pay attention to, or your customers should pay attention to. Great. All right. Thanks, everybody, for the input there. I think now we are going to, my slides will start working again. We're going to move into our panel discussion, and I've got a couple topics that we can pass around. Um, and again, if if anybody on the if anybody on the workshop has any questions that they want to ask, let us know specifically if there's someone you want to address them to or a specific um, slide that you may be referring to, so we make sure we get that in loud and clear. All right, um, moving into the panel discussion. So the first topic that we have for this group is really to get some more feedback from all of you on how are you dealing with your teams right now? What what does it look like working for your company and What's been changing in that realm since all of this came came to be? So I'll, uh, I'll jump in on that one. Um, so we, when all this stuff went down in early March, um, we immediately had a an all hands meeting. Um, so my company's 100% virtual, so it's the the working from home part hasn't really hurt us at all. Um, but everyone was kind of freaked out. You know, what does this mean for 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 myself, my job, my life, all that kind of stuff. And so we um, we had an all-hands meeting and you know, basically we were 100% transparent about here's the state of the company, here's how much money we have in the bank, here's what that means for like everybody, here's our initial thoughts of our plan of how we're going to deal with this and here's the um, you know, here's what it means to you kind of. Um, and then we've been basically on a, you know, I don't say weekly, but a pretty regular basis, we've been updating everyone as to what's going on, both with clients, with finances, um, and what we think is happening in the industry. And um, and so that's been pretty great. And then to kind of make things a little less stressful, we've also instituted a weekly uh, virtual happy hour um, that we do every Friday afternoon. And um, that's been pretty fun. We actually had a, um, a mixologist come in to the last one and teach us how to make some great cocktails. So, um, so we've been trying to keep everything kind of positive, or at least alcoholic. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Positivity um, and I'll, I'll, Yeah, <laughs> keep it positive, or at least alcoholic. I love that. I, I want to snip at that quote, right? <laughs> so um, I'll just jump in and add a few things. So uh, I always, from my standpoint, our team is our first customer, and so. Um, it's very similar in the fashion is increased communication, communicate with, you know, um, compassion and, and, and kindness, right? Uh, and make sure you're adding value and taking care of them. Uh, and I think uh, we worked from home two days a week. Um, and so it was a big transition for a lot of people. A lot of people uh, had kids at home. Um, so we've, we've ramped up our flexibility um, and we've really keep reiterating and keep communicating. Communication is so important and we, we let people know, kind of like Andrew was talking about, is this is where we're at in applying for these different things. These are our top four priorities, which is take care of our team, take care of our clients, recoup any paused you know, accounts after this. So even the paused accounts, we're taking care of them while they're paused and then um, come out of it even stronger. So if we have more free time, how can we level up during this time? How can we improve processes? How can we create content to deliver even more value for our clients? What can we do for our clients uh, right now that maybe we didn't before because we were, you know, kind of, we were growing. We were growing at 26% uh, as we came into this, right? And we've, we've came down probably about 12 to 15%, uh, at least in projected revenue for the next couple months. And so, but we're told our team right away, hey, our goal is to take care of all of you guys. We're applying for everything that's available and, and our goal is to retain everybody throughout this. And then um, we use a tool called Office Vibe where our team all gives feedback. And what's interesting is that our engagement and team satisfaction rate has actually been increasing uh, over this time. And I think it's partly due to our response and increased communication. Uh, they can also submit ideas and feedback, which we've utilized to communicate more about mental health, things to do to take care of themselves, having walking meetings, doing you know things where they're getting outside. So that's just a little bit of what we've been doing. I, I would say just real quickly that um, 
what I've seen is, I mean, I've, I've, I've been a remote employee. Uberall is based in Berlin and has an office in San Francisco. Um, I've seen people get more engaged, sort of consistent with what Kevin is saying. You know, situations like this can be horrible, but they can also help uh, define purpose. They can ignite people's sense of engagement and, um, um, you know, purpose, for lack of a better way to put it. Um, we're we're trying to help our customers. We're trying to help people survive. We're trying to keep our staff together, and that creates um, uh, higher satisfaction in some respects. It's also a very stressful time, so you have to manage that. But this is an opportunity to really build closer connections with your team and customers, in if you do it right. Love that. Really good feedback. I think um, the Duda the Duda side has been really interesting watching all this happen. So we are a very dispersed team. We have groups in Palo Alto, Denver, um, Florinopolis, Brazil, and in Tel Aviv. So while we are used to working at random hours of the day and whenever somebody needs to get a hold of somebody or get on the phone, um, some of these teams have never worked from home before. It's never even been an option. And we're talking about a lot of people that may be living in a, a small apartment in the city really trying to figure out how do I make my life work and and still get my, my job done. And Duda has been pretty busy during this time. Websites are huge. There are lots of customers going to get online. And we're seeing that really we're working just as much as we were and have a lot of things to fill our time. So I think we've done a lot around surveying and really understanding how are people feeling, how are they reacting, and how do we make sure that we're hearing individual needs of people. Some of us may be absolutely fine working from home and our problems come down more to the fact that I had to cancel a vacation and I'm not gonna get to take those two weeks off. Other people may have kids at home that they were not prepared for, or um, all of a sudden have two partners working from home in the same house that they've, they don't have space or even the ability to get these kind of things done. And if you can find ways to make sure that you're addressing individual needs, not not trying to make that broad blanket assessment of how people want to get through this, it's been really helpful. So the same way that we've been talking about really knowing what your customer needs and what your customer's customer needs to feel safe and being deeply involved in that process, we see the same way as, as working with your team. You need to make sure that you're not just handling things as an office or um, maybe a, a specific role might need, but how do we make sure that every individual feels like they can still contribute, that they know what their contribution is doing and be transparent in the things that we can do to help out? All right. So we've kind of talked about taking care of our team, our teams. The next question is, how are you taking care of your customers? And specifically, how are you helping demonstrate more value for the things that you're supplying during this time? Um, we know that that, that value-based conversation is really important right now. I'll uh, jump in. Uh, Greg actually mentioned something in that last slide I thought was great where he highlighted some of the things that you can do to help out clients. And, um, uh, you know, I just naturally jumped in editing videos because I saw there's so much misinformation out there around what was available and, and how to get through this. And so I, I was like, hey, we got to act. And we got to, you know, increase our communication and really get out there and provide as much value and help and leadership as we can. I'm also the on the board at our local chamber, so we have 1,500 businesses that, and so they actually ended up sending that out to all those businesses. So I was just trying to help our clients, but they're like, hey, that was so great. Let's send it out to to all these different people as well. Which, uh, you know, that's where if you're just looking to add value and help people, you tend to, you know, get benefit from that in the long run. So increased communication. Um, like walk them through kind of like, hey, here's the steps you need to do. Here's the dates. Here's the local programs. And then we also offered to jump in. I offered to jump in with any one of our clients to do a deeper brainstorm session and, and think about innovative ways because, again, um, each industry is different. We have some home service companies that across the border in Oregon uh, could continue working. And then uh, in Washington, they couldn't uh, because they weren't considered, you know, essential. Um, and so how do you handle different things there? We had a home builder that was creating virtual walkthroughs. And I mean, so that was the biggest thing is really jumping in and meeting with them one-on-one, -on -one, brainstorming, talking about how to get through this, how they can level up during the time uh, and 
focusing on some of the things that we've always been telling them about was like, hey, if you, you know, had done remarketing, um, you know, or we can do this, we can create a, a remarketing audience to drive more traffic. You can use your email list. We can build a lookalike audience from that. Um, you know, all the different things we've been kind of saying now they're very perceptive and they're, they're very receptive, at least and in, in open to hear those, uh, some of the different things that we've been communicating. And it's like, hey, this is why we suggested those things in the past is so that you have flexibility as things uh, arise. Because if you had that local services ad account set up, we could turn it on right now. Maybe we didn't want to do it before, but now might be a good time to turn on those local service ads. Um, so that's, that's really it is kind of helping them, uh, out where we can and, um, and, and really increasing communication. Uh, I would I would say we're kind of similar to what Kevin's doing talking about. Um, every client, though, of course, some of them just want to be like know the job's getting done, and they don't they're not looking for more communication. They're just like I just one less thing I have to worry about because I'm already worried, right? And so those clients were like, do not drop any ball. You know, don't drop any ball in general, but do not drop these balls in particular and uh, maybe even overdo it, right? Um, and then there are some clients, in general, these guys are sometimes smaller, that really just want to get on the phone and talk about what's going on with their business. And, you know, a 30-minute status call turns into an hour and a half. And so, you know, of course, we're going to stay on the phone for an hour and a half um, because it's not really about SEO now. It's really about how can we help this guy feel, like, okay, because right now things aren't okay. Um, and other than that, the, on a tactical level, what we've really tried to do is where it makes sense, what are the opportunities coming out of this that clients can take advantage of? As an example, if you do some announcement about some COVID thing that generates some links, well, that may be the first set of good links you've gotten in a while, and maybe, maybe we can use that to your SEO advantage over time. Um, or maybe we should be creating a new category. Maybe we should try to, it's one client we've been working on, what's coming next? What's the next... This is kind of cynical, but what's the next phase of panic buying that's going to go on? And do you have that? Can you optimize for it? So meat. it's meat. Yeah, maybe. Like I <laughs> wish I wish I had I wish I had pushed through the hair clipper optimization thing I was pushing a month and a half ago, but we didn't. But um, we didn't really have to because everyone sold out of hair clippers. But um, uh, but that kind of thing you can think about because what's happening now is. As companies go out of stock with items, um, other companies, Google starts ranking other companies that have it. And so if you're already ranked for one thing, you can get ranked for other stuff if you figure out a good SEO plan. So stuff like that is what we've been doing. Great. Greg, anything to add? Um, I could add things, but let's go on to the next topic. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, so I think the next topic was was to go into a little bit more depth around how have you actually adapted your services? So not just this adding value, what have you actually changed and, and how are you bringing something different to market now? And maybe Greg, you can jump in on that one since Andrew and Kevin got to sure. <laughs> put some input on the so, last one. Yeah, so in North America, Uberall works exclusively through partners like Duda. We don't sell anything directly to um, to customers. Uh, here in Europe and other parts of the world, they do have a direct sales uh, organization. But one thing that we've done is we created we created a product called Uberall Essential, which is a listings management, presence management product that is free. It doesn't have the total functionality of the um, the the full product, but it's a a good product that deals with all the things that you need to do: Google My Business key directories. Um, and and has a bunch of functionality, and that's that's been made available uh, to to businesses in categories like healthcare and restaurants uh, and others. So as uh, and and so that's one thing that that we've done to try and address the situation. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And honestly, um, kind of in a similar way, Duda also works with agencies. We don't work directly with your small business customers, so we're having conversations with people that are building in more of this B2B type environment. And we've kind of looked at this as a way to find not just what do people typically offer and how do we make sure that continues to work, but how do we introduce a new skill? How do we make the opportunity available for these customers to take on a new market? And one of the big ones that we've done is introduce a free e-commerce option through the rest of the year. Many of our customers had never kind of dug into e-commerce. It takes a lot of setup. It takes a lot of training of your end user to be able to make sure that they're maintaining and using it well. And at the same time, 
Um, you don't want to set up an e-commerce store that's going to work for the next two months and is only addressing the situation today. You need to be building out a solution that's really going to work for where we are in six months, 12 months, 18 months, and make sure that your customer knows how to adapt and use that. So using something like, like a free offer to get people understanding this part of the business and not afraid to adopt and try it has been really big for us. We've We've seen very similar, like very large upticks in e-commerce usage, site views and visits to all of those kind of stores and being able to do that with a really low barrier to entry for our users to take advantage of this has been great. Um, we're, we're kind of looking at that from a deferred revenue position, right? We, we know that customers need help now. We know that we can build loyalty and really try to give a great solution to someone that they need today. And hopefully that great solution can be coupled with training and education to make sure that it's a great solution a year from now as well. All right, last quick panel question, if you feel like you haven't already given it, does anyone feel like they have one piece of advice that they would give an agency today that you haven't already gotten out there? <laughs> oh, I'd, I'd say conserve your cash, because who knows what's <laughs> happening this month. Yeah. Everything else is uh, just chatter from panelists. <laughs> yeah, well, I'd say the, the, I guess the uh, number one piece of advice I would give is it's a question. I believe questions are extremely powerful. And so um, I try to come up with questions that we ask consistently. Because if you have a shitty question, pardon the language, you get a shitty answer. If you have a good question, you're going to get a good answer. If you have a great question, you're going to get a great answer. And so, um, a question that I ask our team all the time is how can we add even more perceived value at little to no cost to ourselves or our clients? And I think perceived value is a key component because you can deliver all the value in the world, but if the client doesn't perceive that value, then it doesn't matter from the client standpoint, at least. And so um, by doing that and by asking ourselves that question, we came up with a lot of different things like that unique value proposition worksheet that we came out really quick. Is like, hey, this is a way we can scale value to a lot of different people quickly that's meaningful that will have impact. And so I just say figure out what your, your question is, um, which, what's your primary question to drive innovation in your business right now, and make sure that you're asking yourself that consistently. And I would just add one thing quickly, you know, recognize that there are human beings here. These are not just accounts, you know, churn numbers, retention numbers, whatever. There's a human being, there's a human story and really go, go for that and, and, and um, have real empathy for these people and deal, deal with them as humans and not as, as uh, you know, numbers on a spreadsheet. Right. Yeah, I think, I think my last point would just be listen more than you're talking. Um, really, really making sure that you're you're asking good questions, and maybe you're even re-asking questions that you think you already know the answer to. It's a different world, different environment. Uh, you know, really make sure that the assumptions that you made still make sense. And it's okay to get creative. It's okay to try something. We we really just want to be able to understand what the issues are and come up with great ways to try to handle them. All right. With the end of that, we're going to move into some Q&A from the audience, which we do have a couple questions that have come in. Um, Kevin, the first one is directly for you. Can you elaborate a little bit more on how to specifically prove or convince SMBs of their um, improvement in ROI if they decided to move forward with a digital marketing strategy? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of different things. Case studies uh, are probably one of the, the biggest elements. If you're talking about a, a new client and you're uh, talking about potentially convincing them on moving forward with that is to show real life examples, pull up your analytics, show how you're tracking conversions, show them that, you know, like one of the biggest components is that you're measuring the effectiveness and that you are going to continue pivoting your strategy until you drive uh, the right return on results or the return on investment for them. And so if you can show them, hey, here's the call tracking that we're doing for our clients, here's the conversion tracking, here's an e-commerce client where we have direct uh, revenue pulling in, and here's what you know an investment spend might be, and so here's the return on investment. If you show them real life examples and have them actually talk to clients, um, in my experience, I don't know why, uh, very few clients will give them uh, lists of people to talk to, and they don't, they don't reach out. But I actually prefer they do, uh, because 
they'll come to it, they'll come in even stronger and actually have even more value for the work we do. And so we choose our clients very carefully and we want someone who's going to where we can have a major impact for them. And so first look at that. Can you have a major impact for them? If, if you can't, if you're not the right fit for them, you know, find someone who can and, and make sure that you're focusing on clients where you can have a major impact for them and then show them results you've done, have them talk to some other people on your team. Um, yeah, that's what I have there. Great. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, so the next, the next question was, a lot of this conversation seems to be kind of focused around maintaining existing clients, but for those of us that are in the position of having lost a lot of clients, what are you actually doing to attract new ones? How do you see ways of kind of expanding and growing in this market. Um, and I, I'd like to start with a, a very interesting example. So we we talk to a lot of different customers that have, uh, that were maybe doing restaurant POS systems, um, that were doing hair salons, specifically dentists, hotels, uh, but a really interesting one that I've been working with is a customer that actually does photography. And most of their clients are wedding photographers who have taken a huge hit in, in this environment. So instead of trying to go and sell websites to photographers, they actually repurposed their entire community of photographers into a sales team and had them go into the market and sell to sell websites to the businesses and the folks that they do in their own communities. And when they did this, they not only created um, a revenue stream for themselves, they created a revenue stream for these customers that had no other way of, of really bringing an in income at the moment. So it was a very creative thought process the, of using the things that they have available, repurposing something and thinking about it in a new way, and then going out to sell to new folks. And I think that, um, you know, in our industry in particular, websites are not something that everybody always thought they needed. Strangely enough, there were a lot of people two months ago that still didn't know they needed to be online and have that presence available. And there's a huge market out there to find people that haven't updated their websites, haven't taken advantage of all of the things that we've been talking about in this webinar and really need somebody to help push them and guide them to get these things done. And due to agencies, I feel are in a perfect position to be finding those customers and adding value so quickly and creating that, again, that loyalty down the road of, if I can help you through a situation like this, show really good results, this was the right decision. And, and that's, so I, I think, think creatively, think outside the box in terms of who you're approaching and think about a different way to look at your business model for new customers. It, it may not work the same way it used to, and that may be the way it lives for quite a while. Anyone else uh, have some new customer thoughts? <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're kind of weird in that all, almost all of our business comes from referral and word of mouth. So um, we're not doing really anything active other than maybe a webinar um, to get new customers. Um, uh, but this actually this actually is a real case um, and happened. So we have this, the, the way my business started 15 years ago was with my blog, Local SEO Guide. And um, uh, and now we've grown, it's not just me, it's we have 15 people. And um, uh, I kept asking the team to blog. Cause like, this is how the business started. Like, like but no one was, everyone's afraid cause they don't want to, Put themselves out they don't know what to say they're not a blogger or whatever and finally i was like come on guys like what a, come on let's you've got something to say and two of our employees for the first time um wrote blog posts and both of those blog posts generated business it was on a topic i would never have written about couldn't write about didn't care about they wrote about it it got shared in certain communities someone saw it, it as like one guy got hit up by his old high school buddy that he hadn't talked to in 20 years who saw his post was like, cause they were connected on Facebook or something. And he's like, oh wow, I didn't know you did SEO. We need some SEO. And so we're talking to that guy tomorrow. So let, kind of like what you, the example you gave was like leverage your team in unusual ways too. Yeah. I'll, I'll make the, I'll make the general point coming off of Andrew's comment that, you know, right now is the time to, to help people and to be visible through through education, use content, educate them, answer their questions, use video, blog, uh, create helpful checklists. That kind of stuff lays the foundation for later business. It may not turn into immediate acquisition, although Andrew's efforts have, um, but but you need to devote some time to, uh, well, you've got the Midas touch, Andrew, there. 
Um, you, you need to do, you need to devote some time to building your brand and building your visibility um, that will pay dividends later. It can't all be you know if you're at the bottom of the funnel just hammering away, it's not going to be as successful. They want, people want help. They they have real questions. They're using the internet to try and answer them. Be visible where they are looking. I'll add uh, just a little bit because I think. Uh, Greg, you hit pretty much everything I wanted to say on the head, and, and I think people, it's important to understand that right now, a lot of what you do may not drive direct revenue. You have to think of it as deferred revenue. You might be building your brand as you add more value and, and really help people and be compassionate during this time. But do realize that uh, human behavior is where we fall into patterns, and it's really hard to switch those patterns until some kind of big event sometimes happens where people will shift their patterns because of that event. This is one of those events. So you do have the opportunity to change people's behaviors during this time. And so think about how you can come in there and, and, and establish yourself as a thought leader, add more value, help people. And if you're going to do that, you're going to come out of it in a good spot in my, in my thought. Great. All right, I know we're right at time, but I'm going to ask if you guys can all hang out for a couple more minutes just so we can get through another question or two. Um, so sure. there was a question about the Google My Business program. So Andrew, I think you talked about this one a little bit, but can you tell us a little bit more about what kind of a what kind of a program that is? Is there a free version of this? Is there an easy way to start interacting with Google My Business? Sure. Um, Google My Business is free to all businesses that have physical locations. Um, so just go to Google, type Google My Business, log in, and um, and there's a pretty easy process to go to claim your business. They probably already have created a page for you. Um, so you should just go in and claim it and then update it with all the stuff they ask you to update with. So photos, videos if you got them, um, the description, categorize your business correctly, make sure the address is correct, all that kind of stuff. That That's may be the great. single most. Sorry. Go ahead, Greg. No, I, that may be the single most important piece of marketing that you can do if you're a, a business that operates in the real world. Yeah, it'll it'll at the minimum it'll show up for people searching for your brand, and ideally it'll show up when people are searching for your service category. And uh, go in as the business and ask questions and answer the questions as the business as well, because you can do that. And it's a good time right now to use that, because when they're looking for businesses near me that do delivery and you have that content both in your, you know, like if you're doing curbside takeaway or if you have those questions in there, that uh, content will be helpful. Awesome. Thanks. The other question that we had was, um, are the offers that are coming in with Duda right now that are free, do they revert to paid after the time period is over? Um, so the way that we're looking at free offers is we're really kind of building out separate programs for what we're offering for free. And we're allowing customers at the end of those times to move into the package that fits them best. So we're not just going to shut things off or, or kind of um, take it away at the end. We really wanna be able to show value and help customers understand what they're getting and then make a decision of what the next best place is. If you're using the free e-commerce store now, Maybe you really do need to upgrade to an unlimited amount of e-commerce features and functionality. Maybe you need something very simple after this is done. We'll work with you to make sure that those are all happening and getting you in the right place at the end of it. Um, if anyone else has free offers that they're that they have out in the marketplace right now, it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on, you know, how how do you see those ending and how do you want to work with customers when you come to the end of a free period? Uh, one of the things we did. Um, Again, it's just a way we innovated to do this is we offered three free hours of work to any businesses that um, needed it. And we told them we were only doing two a week. And so we got <laughs> filled out for a couple months and we're going out and doing free work. So that it was a way that they can see it. So it ends when we do the three free hours of, of work for them. Um, but we try to deliver as much value as we can in that time so that down the road when they're thinking about, um, you know, choosing a, an agency to work with that will be top of mind for them. And in terms of the Uber All Central product that I mentioned uh, earlier, I am not the product guy on this, and so I can't speak with total authority about the about the roadmap. But I think that I think that they're um, you know going to evaluate as the situation evolves. I mean, it's initially a three month um, period, but then I think they're going to look at where the market is in three months and make a decision about how to proceed. So, but beyond that, I'm not able to say anything because I'm not close enough to it. Absolutely fair. All right, guys. 
Andrew, I think that was Andrew, the, uh, that tool that you created to post to all the GMBs. Are you going to roll that out free for somebody? Uh, we've actually <laughs> I'd like that. <laughs> I think we're actually going to open source it. So, um, so we've built a lot of tools in the last year that we've open sourced. If you go to localseoguide.com and hover over the guides link in the nav, you'll see a free local tools, uh, free tools button. Just click on that. We, um, we've open sourced a Google My Business um, image change alert. So if Google changes the image on your GMB page, you can get notified. Um, we open sourced a page speed report for every template on your site. So you can run it across a big site and find out the Google page speed core scores at a template level. Um, and a couple of others. So um, yeah, we might we might do that auto poster, but um, in the meantime, it's just for us and our clients, of course. All right, <laughs> perfect. Well, thank you guys for sticking around and answering uh, a couple of last questions with us. I know we ran a little bit over. I did also want to mention you can get more information on all of us, our programs, at the links below. Um, I think all of us are providing materials that you can start with. At least make sure that you're kind of catching up on what's happening in the industry, as well as just blog posts and information about what we're seeing, what we're learning and what we're doing. So, you know, feel free to reach out to any of us and make sure that you can find those resources that you need. Awesome, guys. Thank you so much for participating with us today. I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Liz. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. You too.